Human impacts on biodiversity are represented by the acronym HIPCO, which describes the primary factors that are leading to a loss of biodiversity. Habitat loss, invasive species, population growth, pollution, climate change, and over-exploitation. I'll keep these letters on the screen, and I'll make the letter red when we're discussing a concern related to each of these factors. In video 5, we discuss natural changes to biodiversity, primary and secondary succession, natural events that may lead to extinction, and of course, evolution. In this video, I want to look at how human activity is affecting biodiversity. Extinction is a normal and expected process in Earth's biological history. The background extinction rate estimates the number of species that go extinct per 10,000 species every 100 years. Now, there are many different ways to measure that, but that is Mr. W's favorite unit, so we're using it. Looking at the fossil record, scientists estimate the background extinction rate before humans showed up to be about two, meaning two out of every 10,000 species would go extinct every 100 years. Now, this figure is taken from a 2015 study published in Science Advances. Different studies will come up with different figures, but this one is the one I like best. This number is different, though, for every taxa, so we'll just stick to discussing the extinction rate of vertebrates. The International Union of Conservation of Nature documented 477 extinct species since 1900, including those that are extinct in the wild but otherwise kept in a zoo, but we'll consider that extinct for all intents and purposes. This puts the current extinction rate at 470 species. That's a lot more than two. That's using the most conservative estimates. Uh, this leads many scientists to say we are entering the sixth mass extinction. But this time the cause isn't a giant meteor or massive volcano eruption. It's us. Habitat loss is the leading reason behind this lowering in biodiversity. And habitat loss is really split into three ways that habitats can be disturbed. Destruction, fragmentation, and degradation. The leading cause of habitat loss is, well, habitat destruction. Since humans began doing human stuff, an estimated 80% of our forests have been removed or heavily degraded. We've lost 30% of all coral reefs since just the 1980s. Uh, the permanent ice coverage is declining at 11.5% per decade. Only half of American wetlands remain. Half of all temperate grasslands have been converted to farmland. The organisms that depend on these areas for habitat and food are struggling, and we're losing species at an unprecedented rate as a result. However, the total destruction of a habitat is rare. Even when logging or converting land for agriculture, small plots of land remain intact. Now, this might be due to government protections or some other reason, but we haven't yet torn down everything. Now, these smaller plots of remaining land have some problems too. Habitat fragmentation occurs when large habitats are broken into smaller isolated areas. This is generally caused by the construction of roads, pipelines, or of course logging and agriculture. These smaller areas may not be large enough or connected enough to support species that need a large territory in order to find mates and food. It also makes it difficult for migratory species to find places to rest and feed along their migration routes. Remember this map that shows the historical and current forest range? Well, here's a map that shows the range of forest that is large enough to support its original biodiversity. That's a lot smaller. This sort of habitat fragmentation leads to an edge effect. The edge refers to a transition between two different habitats. This transition zone is sometimes called an ecotone. Um, this one in this picture, for example, is the ecotone between a desert ecosystem and a forest ecosystem in Oregon, right by the Cascade Mountains. Now, naturally occurring ecotones tend to have higher biodiversity because there's a larger variety and diversity of available niches, and the transition tends to be gradual. However, if an ecotone is produced artificially, say due to deforestation, the edge effect results in much lower biodiversity. 
Once an area is cleared of the forest, well, the soil is left, so secondary succession can begin. Now, the first species to colonize the area are most likely going to be generalist species, right? Species with a wide niche and no really specific habitat requirements. This makes these early colonizers great competitors, and they can push their way farther into the forest. Now, this changes the structure of the forest ecosystem, leading to a decrease in biodiversity in what was left. Now we can help manage or at least mitigate the edge effect by being more strategic with our land use. Leaving a large fragment intact is better than leaving multiple smaller fragments. It's also better to have fragments closer together rather than spaced farther apart, as this might at least allow a few individuals or even populations to cross between the fragments. The best solution is to include habitat corridors in between these fragments, allowing species a place to safely remain in between all the fragments of the original habitat. This map shows the location of tiger reserves in India, and the dark shaded areas are the corridors that were established to allow these tigers to have an extended range for the sake of finding food and mates. A degraded habitat is one that remains intact, but affected negatively in some way. Uh, the two big drivers of habitat degradation are pollution and invasive species. Pollutants from human activities like mining or the burning of fossil fuels can be deposited in an ecosystem changing air quality or soil quality, resulting in a habitat that cannot support as much biodiversity. Acid rain, for example, can reduce the pH of soils, making it difficult for seeds to germinate and reducing the cation exchange capacity, so existing plants can't get as many nutrients from the soil. Invasive species are non-native species that can cause harm to an ecosystem by out-competing native organisms for food and habitat. These organisms can be brought to a new area by accident when these organisms are inadvertently introduced into the area. Uh, for example, the zebra mussel, which is native to Europe, was introduced to the United States in the 1980s because they stowed away on trading ships. Sometimes invasive species are introduced on purpose, like the European buckthorn, which was brought into the U.S. in the 1800s as an ornamental plant for gardening and landscaping. But at the time, we didn't know these would become invasive. The 10-10-10 rule describes how species become invasive. One out of every 10 imported organisms will become established in the wild. One out of those 10 introduced species can actually establish themselves in the ecosystem. And one out of 10 species that establish themselves in the ecosystem are actually going to become invasive. Please don't mistake non-native and invasive. There are plenty of non-native plants that cause no problem to the ecosystems. Now, an organism can become invasive because they have no new predators in the new habitat. Uh, most invasive species are generalists and are selected, so they grow faster than native species, and as a result, their population grows faster, so they just simply outcompete the native species. Some invasive plants have another weapon in their arsenal. They're allelopathic, which means they secrete chemicals that alter the immediate environment to prevent the growth of competing plants. Where these organisms are originally found, right? Where they came from? The other species around them co-evolved with these conditions. So in the native area, competitors can deal with it. But in a new area, it becomes really difficult to manage them. The management of native species ends up being something humans can do as part of a restoration project. And more on that in the Closer Look segment later in this video. Going deeper into HIPCO, we know that human population growth and the resulting need for more agricultural land, lumber, and mining all lead to habitat destruction. And the energy use associated with the growing population released greenhouse gases and pollutants. Now, for a review of these issues, I'd suggest re-watching the appropriate videos. But to add to it, a large number of organisms have become completely domesticated by humans and are managed for economic return like cattle, pigs, or even honeybee colonies. This domestication for the benefit of a growing human population resulted in a decrease in the genetic diversity of these species, also because they're artificially selected for whatever traits we like best, thus reducing the overall gene pool.
Climate change can cause the loss of habitat via changes in temperature, precipitation, and sea level rise. This map shows areas where the changing climate is causing shifts in the range of plants specific to each biome. In the United States, we see specific types of trees also shifting in range as the northern United States becomes warm enough to support species otherwise only found in the farther south regions. The loss of ice in the Arctic, even, is a loss of habitat, as that ice is habitat and hunting grounds for quite a few species, like this adorable seal and this family of polar bears, which won't be there for much longer. Overexploitation is just another human activity that leads to habitat destruction as we extract renewable resources faster than they can be replenished. Again, for a review of these, feel free to rewatch the appropriate videos. All these impacts have been leading to a decline in biodiversity and the endangerment of many species. An endangered species is one that is likely to become extinct in the near future. Now, there are many reasons an organism can be endangered or eventually fall into extinction. Sometimes these reasons are natural, right? All species in a given ecosystem compete for resources, territory, food, mates, habitat, and this competition can lead to endangerment or extinction. But those are historical reasons. Nowadays, species are on the endangered species list because of habitat destruction, being extensively overhunted, or being outcompeted by an invasive species. Not all species will be in danger of extinction when exposed to the same changes in their ecosystem. Generalist species tend not to be too much at risk as they are better able to acclimate to a changing climate. Specialist species, however, with very specific and limited habitats or specialized diet are at greater risk. Let's look at what we can do to prevent the extinction of endangered species. Let's look at the rhino as an example. Many species of rhino are endangered. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were about 500,000 rhinos roaming the earth. Today, less than 29,000 remain. And most of those are in protected areas like national parks or reserves, not too many wild ones. One of the leading factors that reduce their population is poaching. Rhino horns are used in traditional medical practices in parts of Asia and some parts of Africa. They have no established medicinal value whatsoever. It's traditional medicine, not medicine medicine. The limiting of poaching helps, but much illegal poaching still continues. On average, a rhino is killed by a poacher every 15 hours. And many of the countries where poaching is a problem, like Zimbabwe, are poor and have limited resources to protect their animals. Now that poverty is also what leads some to poaching as a means to make money. This is more than just an environmental issue. A lot of these global climate change issues are related and it's an environmental justice issue. Nonetheless, the criminalization of poaching is the best strategy to prevent poaching. The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, or CITES, is an international treaty that ensures any international trade in plants or animals does not threaten their survival in the wild by banning or heavily regulating trade in threatened and endangered species and products that come from threatened or endangered species. In the United States, the Endangered Species Act is a law that protects endangered species. Aside from just establishing laws that protect individual species, it also provides a program for the conservation of habitats in which endangered organisms are found by establishing critical habitat areas that limit what can be done in that area commercially. Because habitat destruction is the overall leading cause of biodiversity, the protection of habitat is very important. A lot of endangered species conservation attempts involve not only a protection of their habitat, but also a breeding program. These are programs generally run by wildlife reserves and zoos, where animals mate in a protected area and are later released into the wild. There are some challenges to this, though. Because you're using a small pool of animals, the genetic diversity of a population recovered through captive breeding is much smaller. And because these organisms are raised in captivity, they may have behavioral differences from their wild relatives that might limit their survival once released. Now, these programs do their best to minimize these challenges. 
Ecological restoration is the process of recovering an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. This generally involves removing invasive species, planting more native species, and the long-term management of these through human intervention. 